Part one. You will hear a woman talking to some students about her job. Look at questions one to four. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to give a talk in this series of employment lectures. I'm here this evening to tell you about my job. I'm going to tell you what I like about it, what I don't like about it, and what I hope to do in the future. Okay. Well, I'm a police officer. I've been in the police for just over five years, and part of my job is to give talks to students about police work. People often ask why I joined the police, so maybe I'll start there. I've always been interested in law and order, so I went to study law at university. But、uh, when I got there, I realised that I was more interested in the practical side of law than the theory. So I applied to work with the police force in my spare time. Then, as soon as I graduated, I was accepted for training. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. As you know, our job is to protect the public from criminals and defend the law. So obviously, the police force has to work every day of the week, day and night. This means we're often at work when everyone else is relaxing with friends and family, and we can't always be around for special occasions like birthdays and New Year's Eve. On top of that, we have a lot of extra work at weekends, especially when there's a football match and the fans are out celebrating. So our working hours are one disadvantage of police work. A lot of the time, we have to work with the public to avoid problems, and we get special training for that. But we can't always prevent trouble. So another disadvantage of the job is the danger. I mean, we know that some of the people we have to arrest will attack us. Now for the advantages. Well, one of the advantages is that police work is well paid. As I've said, it's a difficult job, and police officers work hard for their pay. But there are many more advantages. For example, sometimes the work's fun. Especially when we have to protect famous people from their own fans, I've met quite a lot of celebrities in my job, and I must say I enjoy seeing them close up and finding out what they're really like as people. But for me, the biggest advantage is the job satisfaction. Speaking for myself, I would say I get the most job satisfaction when I help someone, or solve a problem in a community, and in the future. I'd like to train to be a detective. I think I'd be good at that. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about facilities for students with disabilities. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen.
Welcome to Student Times, the programme with all the latest on what's happening at universities around the country. Today we'll be discussing disabled applicants and the kind of support they can expect to find or not find at the university of their choice. With me to tell us more is Student Disability Advisor Sally Taylor. Good morning, Sally. Good morning, Hugh. I'd like to start by pointing out that although one in four people has some kind of disability, the proportion among students is much lower. This is partly because most students are under 25 and many people only develop their disabilities as they get older, but it's also because some universities don't do much to encourage access. Mm. It is true, though, that some have quite sticky problems when it comes to, um, for instance, wheelchair access, um, ancient buildings, cobbled streets built centuries ago, and so on. When faced with such a situation, some universities make an extra special effort to provide for students with particular disabilities, while others have specialist accommodation. In fact, all universities should have a written policy statement on students with disabilities, setting out what facilities they have, what their attitude is, and what they're prepared to do. But having said that, only you can properly understand the challenges of any disability you have, and so before accepting a place at a university, or even while you're considering applying, if only to raise the university's awareness, it's good to talk to them and find out how much they can and will do for you. The problem is who to talk to. Most universities and some students' unions have a disability advisor who is supposed to know what facilities they already have and will help with further arrangements if necessary or possible. However, all too often this person is a token. Sometimes it's just an extra responsibility given to a secretary. They don't know what the situation is in practice and they don't have any real authority to change anything. So, given that for any prospective student it's best to visit a university before applying, it's an especially good idea for students with disabilities or special needs to check whether the place really does come up to scratch. Uh -huh. In general, the university should provide personal care and assistance, and there are certain key features to look out for if you have a particular disability, including the following. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Firstly, if your mobility is impaired, check there are ramps and easy access to all buildings, not just accommodation or teaching rooms. Then, when you're inside, look for clear instructions on fire and emergency procedures for the disabled. Also, make sure there are lifts that work, not the usual ones that seem to be out of order half the time. And check for suitable lavatory facilities. There is a different set of things to look for if you suffer from any kind of hearing impairment. There should be induction loops in lecture theatres, flashing sirens in all rooms and in accommodation, visual doorbells that light up when somebody calls round to see you. If it is your sight that is impaired, there obviously need to be braille translators of books and documents. In all buildings, the stairs, floors, doorways and windows must have clear markings and there also have to be special fire and emergency procedures for you. If you suffer from dyslexia, you will need a computer for general use and in exams. And as exams may take you longer to complete, you should be allowed extra time in which to do so. This applies to work in general too. There are of course many other possible health difficulties that you may suffer from, such as diabetes, epilepsy or heart conditions. If this is the case, check the availability of access to appropriate treatment, including medication and or therapy. Finally, 
Make sure that in the event of an emergency, it is clear what you and other people who may be involved have to do. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. So, Jake and Amanda, how did the project go? Very well, I think, Dr Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically, what makes successful people? Let's call them top achievers successful. Yes, how are they different from us? What do they do that other, less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me, then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it. But it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself, with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax, could leave their work at the office, prize close friends and family life, and spent a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway, go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important though, Amanda. Yes, I agree. But being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two-thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer and only one-third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Actually, in the end, they often have both, because they enjoy what they are doing, so their work is better and their rewards higher. Yes, Jake, that certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. 
Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hard-working people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright. She is so worried that she has missed something, she still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well, top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. They don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them so they can do better next time. Hmm. Well, would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I, or we, came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes. And we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognise that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes. Loners, who are often over-concerned about rivals, can't delegate important work or decision-making. Their performance is limited because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job and learned something into the bargain too. Now, there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about fireworks. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this short talk on the subject of fireworks. Now, fireworks, as I'm sure many of you know, were invented in China, though there has long been disagreement as to exactly when, or even in which century. The consensus nowadays, though, is that it was in the 6th, as there is considerable evidence of war rockets being made then. We also know that fireworks were in use by the 7th century in Arabia, where they were called Chinese arrows, reflecting their military potential. It then took a long time for them to spread to Europe. In fact, it wasn't until the 1200s that fireworks made their appearance there. The basic ingredients of fireworks have changed little to this day. Their explosive capacity comes mainly from black powder, also known as gunpowder, which is produced from a mixture of charcoal, sulphur and potassium nitrate. A modern aerial firework, the kind used nowadays in big public displays, not the small rocket type that you might remember from your childhood, is normally made in the form of a shell, often a sphere about the size of a peach. Inside the shell are a number of stars, surrounded by black powder, 
and running through the center of the round shell is a charge that makes the firework explode when it reaches the desired altitude. This is known as the bursting charge. When this explodes, it ignites the outside of the stars, which begin to burn with bright showers of sparks. Since the explosion throws the stars in all directions, you get the huge sphere of sparkling light that is so familiar at firework displays. A shell of this kind is launched from a 75 mm diameter mortar, which in some ways resembles the type used by the military. The mortar is a steel, or increasingly for safety reasons, shatterproof plastic pipe. This is likely to be 500 mm long and sealed at one end. The other end is aimed at the sky, and at the bottom of the pipe, below the shell, is placed a cylinder containing black powder. This has a long fuse, which projects out of the tube. When this is lit, it quickly burns down to the lifting charge, which explodes to launch the shell. In so doing, it also lights the shell's fuse. The shell's fuse burns while the shell rises to its correct altitude and then ignites the bursting charge so it explodes. More complicated shells are divided into sections and burst in two or three phases. Shells like this are called multi-break shells. They may contain stars of different colours and compositions to create softer or brighter light, more or less sparks, etc. Some shells contain explosives designed to crackle in the sky, or whistles that explode outward with the stars. The sections of a multi-break shell are ignited by different fuses, and the bursting of one section ignites the next. The shells must be assembled in such a way that each section explodes in sequence to produce a distinct, separate effect. The pattern that an aerial shell paints in the sky depends on the arrangement of stars inside the shell. For example, if the stars are equally spaced in a circle, with black powder inside the circle, you will see an aerial display of smaller star explosions equally spaced in a circle. To create a specific figure in the sky, for instance a heart shape, you create an outline of the figure in stars inside the shell. Then you place explosive charges inside those stars to blow them outward into the shape of a large heart. Each charge has to be ignited at exactly the right time, or the whole thing is spoiled. Many other shapes have particular names, like the willow. This is formed by stars that fall in the shape of willow tree branches, spreading a little to the side and then downwards. The high charcoal composition of the stars makes them long-burning, so they may even stay visible until they hit the ground. The ring shell is fairly basic. It is produced by stars exploding outwards to produce a symmetrical ring of coloured lights. More complex is the pattern created by the palm, which contains large comets, or charges, in the shape of a solid cylinder. These travel outwards, explode and then curve downwards, like the limbs of a palm tree. The serpentine, the last one for now, is different again. When this one bursts, it sends small tubes of incendiaries scattering outwards in random paths, which may culminate in exploding stars. It can be quite spectacular. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
You're never gonna make it, you're not good enough There's a million other people with the same stuff You really think you're different, man, you must be kidding Think you're gonna hit it, but you just don't get it It's impossible, it's not probable, you're responsible Too many obstacles, you gotta stop it, yo You gotta take it slow, you can't be a pro Don't waste your time no more Who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? I don't give a damn if you say you disapprove I'm gonna make my move, I'm gonna make it soon And I'll do it cause it's what I wanna fucking do Cause all these opinions and all these positions They come in in millions, they block in your vision But no, you can't listen, that shit is all fiction Cause you hold the power as long as you're driven make it there's no way that you make it And maybe you can fake it But you're never gonna make it Are you just gonna take that? Make them take it all back Don't tell me you believe that Are you just gonna take that?